I just spent like half an hour trying to do like some overhead stuff for an unboxing. I've never done an unboxing before. Uh, I tried the Canon on a Magic Arm, which was too droopy. And then I tried the Osmo, which I just screwed into the end of a C-stand and put over the back of the camera and it didn't quite reach. So we're going without overhead today. Not an unboxing guy. Anyway, all my camera troubles aside, can you guess what this is? Oh gosh. This is way bigger than I expected it to be. So uh, let's see what it is. Where's my daggum knife? You know those little second pockets in some pants? That's what it's stuck in. Okay, where is the knife in this thing? That's a saw. Ah, there it is. All right, oh, there it is. A lovely little Society Awards card. Congratulations on your subscriber milestone. Oh, thank you. This award was inspected and packaged with great care by Rick. Thank you, Rick. Nice piece of thick paper. More congratulations. You did it. One mission, one channel, and one more thing, one million subscribers. Congratulations. You may have started with just a few viewers, but your voice, passion, and creativity have now touched the lives of people around the world. And the community you've built is enriched by the stories you've shared as you bring people together. Well, that's very true, I think. This is gaudy. <laughs> How do we get this thing out of here? Okay. Be gone. Presented to Second Thought for passing one million subscribers. That is shiny. I was trying to get a nice view for you without blinding the camera. There we go. How about that? Thumbnail? This is way bigger than the silver one that I got several years ago. And you know the funny thing about this? You're supposed to get one of these when you hit a million subscribers. Second Thought, as of this morning, is sitting at like 1.68 million subscribers. And unless I've done my math wrong, that's almost 700,000 subscribers late. So what happened was they sent me the, hey, congratulations notification in the app a couple weeks after I hit a million. Um, and when I went to redeem the code, it said I had already redeemed it. So it turns out they had sent me the same code as several years before when I hit 100,000. So I said, okay, whatever, you know what? I don't care, uh, I don't need a plaque. But fast forward 700,000 subs and I see a link somewhere about checking your channel's eligibility for an award. So I figure, what the heck, I've got a few minutes, click it, has me plug in my channel details and comes back with, hey, it looks like you get a gold button after all. That was a few weeks ago. And finally, like two years late, here is my big stupid gold play button. Actually know where to put this I'm just I'm just gonna place of honor okay so this week I figured with getting the play button I take a little stroll down memory lane and walk you through how I built my channel from nothing to where it is today so first a little background the year was 2016 little JT was working at Best Buy selling cameras not a terrible gig for someone who likes cameras but the pay wasn't very good and the work was not fun hey where's y'all TVs at you can see them from anywhere in the store. There's a giant wall of TVs. Anyway, that, that was a little bit of PTSD. Um, but anyway, a buddy of mine had recently started a YouTube channel and he'd found a little success. And I thought, huh, I'm a better editor than he is. Maybe I should give it a try. So I did. I had studied journalism and film production in school. So I already had a camera, a tripod, a microphone, some cheap lights, pretty much everything I needed to get started. Except of course, what the channel would be about. Back then, the infotainment niche was really starting to blow up. CGP Grey and Kurtzgesagt were household names, so I figured, why not start there? My idea was to make a channel dedicated to the things in life worth thinking about, hence the name Second Thought. I knew I didn't want to appear on camera, I was way too shy for that back then, so I needed something to show on screen. 
I wasn't any good at animation, didn't have money for a stock footage account, but I did have a whiteboard and some markers, and I was okay at drawing stick figures. I set up a little folding table in my tiny apartment living room, I put the camera on a tripod pointing straight down, and I just recorded myself drawing stick figures to illustrate whatever I was talking about in that episode. I was a little bit cringe back then, so my channel started out as a series on logical fallacies. I made six of them, and I made them private years ago, and I haven't watched one since. You want to watch one now? One sec. All right. Well, this is going to be weird. I haven't... Mm. I genuinely... I don't watch my stuff after it's done, uh, and I certainly don't go back and watch stuff from six years ago. So let me just... Let me take one sec here and just confirm that it's not unbearably cringe. No. Uh-uh. Uh, those will never see the light of day again. Uh-uh. <laughs> no. I guess the moral of this part of the story is that every YouTuber, literally every single one, has at least a few videos they'd rather forget. Don't be afraid to make a bad video. You can always make it private down the line. Anyway, back in those early days, I would work the 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. shift at Best Buy. And then I'd drive home, have dinner with my wife, and then I'd work until like 3 in the morning, shooting, narrating, and editing my videos. At first, I released two episodes per week, and that really, like really wasn't sustainable. But the way I saw it, if I put in a bunch of work, the algorithm would have to notice me. It doesn't really work that way. So a few weeks in, I slowed down and focused more on making interesting videos and putting them out when they were ready. I started learning basic After Effects animation, I got some useful plugins for transitions. Shout out to Mr. Horse, that one free After Effects plugin really, really helped me. I got a little drawing tablet so I could do digital cartoons instead of using the whiteboard. Lots of little steps to gradually improve my production quality. I told myself that if my channel ever started making money, I'd set a one per week upload schedule and stick to it. But until then, I was just gonna do what worked for me. Growth was slow at first, very, very slow. For the first eight months, I would get maybe a few hundred views if I was lucky. I cracked a thousand once or twice. Along the way, I had a graphic designer friend build a fancier logo for me, which was just the coolest thing in the world at the time. Then on January 13th, 2017, I uploaded the video that changed everything for me. What if NASA had the US military budget? It was a question that I'd been thinking about for a while. Even back then, I had some vaguely political ideas and recognized that space was a lot cooler than war. Not amazing political analysis, but that's okay. Anyway, I post the video and some website shouts it out. I think they've since shut down. It wasn't a website I was familiar with, but bless those people. Um, because of them, my channel finally got noticed by the algorithm and not just noticed, I got launched from a few thousand subs to 75,000 in under a week. I had never seen any channel grow like that before and I was kind of at a loss and it just kept growing. I hit 100,000 in early February, 200,000 by the end of March. Notch the Minecraft guy retweeted one of my videos in mid-April. Then I hit 300,000 the following month. This type of growth is not what you usually see on YouTube, and I don't think I've seen a rise quite as meteoric before or since. And that's not me bragging. I mean, my channel was nothing special. This is me saying, I got really lucky, and things don't always work out this way. Factors beyond my control picked up my content and ran with it. I hadn't put any more effort into the NASA video than I had the previous episode that got like a thousand views, a couple thousand maybe. And yet here I was after eight months of nothing, looking at a growth chart I could never have imagined. And this is when I started to seriously think, okay, maybe I can make this happen. Maybe, maybe I can do YouTube full time. So let's zoom out a little bit. A couple months before the NASA video, I had quit my job at Best Buy and accepted an inside sales position at a software company. I figured if I could sell cameras, I could sell enterprise software, right? <laughs> no, boy, I was very wrong. And you know, to be fair, it wasn't entirely my fault. It wasn't a great work environment and they fired the guy who was training me and just kind of left me to flounder. Anyway, I was super depressed and I needed to get out of there. I remember talking to my wife one evening and being like, if this YouTube thing picks up, I think I'm gonna quit. We didn't know it at the time, but this was the most critical moment for the channel and honestly, the trajectory of our lives. If she had said, that's stupid, don't do that, stick to it, learn the ropes, be a good normal person, I would have stayed or at least gone back to Best Buy. But she didn't. She supported my decision. So Kelsey, thank you. 
Second Thought wouldn't exist without you. Everybody say thank you, Kelsey, in the comments. <laughs> She's gonna love that. Anyway, I put out a video that gets 8,000 views. That's good enough for me. I go to the boss, I turn in my badge, and I never look back. I lasted all of two months in that job. Never let anyone tell you quitting something terrible is a sign of weakness. Quitting is great. Big fan of quitting. One of the best decisions I've made. So now I was officially unemployed, making maybe 50 bucks a month on Google AdSense, and Kelsey was working as a cashier at a local grocery store. Looking back now, we're like, why did we do that? We were very close to having a really bad time. And to make matters worse, Kelsey's beat up old car decided to give out on us, and we needed something. I remember sitting at the car dealership and checking the views on the NASA video and just about falling out of my chair. No, this, this must be a mistake. 11,000 views? And I just kept checking every few minutes while we were there and the number just... <sighs> if this kept up, we would be okay. We could support ourselves. Of course, no channel can ride the wave forever. Eventually, that momentum is going to wear off. But luckily for me, that initial surge was enough to establish a solid audience who would come back every week and watch my videos. They may not have performed as well as the NASA video, but they performed well enough. The rest of the story is less dramatic. Figuring out how to maintain a healthy level of growth, find a good work-life balance, keep improving my content, and just see what happens. So that's what I did. I started a Patreon and a Discord server to help supplement our income when we had bad months. I learned more about After Effects and video production in general. I gradually became a better writer and presenter, and for quite a while, everything was great. And then, sometime in 2018, I got bored. This is the thing that kills YouTube channels. I didn't recognize it at the time, but I was burned out. One video a week for two years, producing them all alone, late nights, struggling to figure out what the algorithm wanted, it all took a toll. Views were steadily declining, growth was stagnating. I was getting really worried I'd have to pull the plug and go find a real job. I kept trudging along like that for another two years, until March of 2020. And I think March 2020 is a chapter marker for humanity in general. Most people I know divide time into pre-COVID and post-COVID now. I had been reading a lot about political theory and socialism. I'd followed Bernie's first campaign, and when I saw just how bad the US pandemic response was, I just felt like I needed to do something useful with the platform I'd been given. I had about 750,000 subs at this point and I had just put out the most half-assed video I had ever made. Something about mosquitoes. I told myself, okay, I will make one video about socialism, and if it performs well, great, I've done my part. If it doesn't, if it torpedoes my channel, I'll go back to Best Buy. I just needed to say some things. So, I make the video. Capitalism and the American Pandemic Response. It ended up being five times the length of the previous video, my longest video by far up to that point. And to this day, it's the only video I've ever put up a day late. I really wanted it to be good. Looking back, it's just okay, but at the time, I was really happy with it. And you know what? Other people liked it too. It performed really well. Today, the Mosquito video is sitting at like 89,000 views, and the Pandemic video has over 1.7 million. People could tell I cared about this stuff. There is no better way to sync your channel than to lie to your audience and yourself that you enjoy the work you're doing. That was me before I made the switch to political content. And I knew it too. I desperately wanted the pandemic video to do well. And when it did, once again, good enough for me. I dropped what I was doing before and I went full steam ahead with the new thing. So this became something like my fourth iteration of the channel. I went from stick figures on a whiteboard to digital drawings, to stock footage, to political content. And my audience stuck with me. At least a lot of them did. I lost a few thousand subs with the pandemic video, but within a couple days, I had made up the difference and then some with new subscribers. At this point, I go to Kelsey and I'm like, honey, I'm doing the quitting thing again. And she's like, so now we get to another period of nose to the grindstone, building a new image for the channel, learning more about political theory, getting involved in organizing, trying to find ways to make complex topics more accessible. This went on for another year and a half. And at this point, I had reached about the extent of what I could do by myself. I didn't have the time or the skill set to improve the channel any further, and that was starting to bother me. And as luck would have it, one morning I opened my email and found a message from Oscar, a bright-eyed young whippersnapper who wanted to write for Second Thought. I hadn't really considered a writer before. I'd been thinking more about bringing on an editor, but I thought, what the heck, this guy's friends with someone I've worked with on other projects, let's try him out. TLDR, he's great. 
With a little guidance, he synthesized my writing style nearly perfectly, and he's a way better researcher than I could ever be. So for the first time, Second Thought grew beyond just me. Suddenly, I had more time to dedicate to other projects. The Deprogram, my podcast with Hakeem and Ugopnik, came shortly after. That absolutely blew up. We were doing something in the socialist politics space that hadn't really been done before. Three people from three different parts of the world, with unique experiences and perspectives, getting together to educate the audience while actually having fun. Most politics podcasts are dry, boring, and depressing. We wanted to be the opposite of that. Anyway, thanks to the podcast, I could afford to bring on a creative director for Second Thought. And I knew just the person. Andrew and I go way back. Like, we were shooting videos on his mom's camcorder in seventh grade. He is a brilliant editor, and his style is among the best I've seen anywhere. He immediately went to work putting together a style guide for the channel, and overhauling my amateur edits in a way I couldn't begin to replicate. With Oscar and Andrew on board, we managed to build Second Thought into something that I think is really special. And the audience thinks so too. I've gotten more comments on the quality of the writing and production value in the last couple years than I had in the entire history of the channel. Andrew and Oscar have been on the team now for over two years, and the channel is thriving. In the last couple of months, we brought on a great new editor named Dean. He's handling half the Second Thought edits, as well as the First Thought analysis episodes. We've cut ties with Nebula to go fully independent again. And in March, you'll be able to find our content on another streaming platform, so stay tuned for that. And that pretty much brings us up to today. I don't usually think of Second Thought as having a particularly interesting story, but putting this episode together has reminded me of so many things I'd forgotten. The risks I took early on, quitting my job, assuming YouTube would continue to grow, switching formats multiple times, changing my branding multiple times. And that's not even to mention the enormous amount of luck I had with my channel getting picked up by some random website and the algorithm running with it. That's something a lot of creators don't mention. Luck is absolutely a factor. Yes, of course, hard work is too, but don't discount the luck. So anyway, I guess what I'm saying with all this is that I did everything wrong and my channel is thriving. YouTube has best practices like anything else, but I think the most important thing is that you're having fun. If you're making content and the audience can tell you don't care about it, that's game over. That's why Second Thought was on the decline before I made the switch to political content. I was burned out. I hated making those videos. The era of YouTube we're in now is one where authenticity and genuine interest are way more important than having a big team or a super polished end product. Those things absolutely help, as evidenced by viewer response since the teams expanded, but people want to connect with the person they're watching, too. Anyway, if you want to learn more about the specifics of creating a YouTube channel, my last video goes through the process step by step, including a bunch of useful tips I picked up along the way. Okay, that's all. I'm gonna go find a place to put that giant thing. Mm -hmm.